Now, I suppose the vast majority of people are very concerned as they look at the world these days and see its brokenness with these terrible wars in Ukraine and Russia, and then in Israel, Gaza, Lebanon, the wider Middle East, and there are many other wars that we never see reported on the news. Uh, Shakespeare wrote that famous uh, play about Hamlet, in which Hamlet said, the whole world is out of joint. Now, that was written 400 years ago. And I suppose many people would say the same kind of thing uh, when we look at the world today. They're not the first ones. See if you can position this statement. Um, if you are seeking for an easy life, you've, bo you've been born in the wrong generation. That was said, written by Tolstoy, the Russian writer, at the beginning of the 1900s. Or a Chilean poet writing recently, um, uh, towards the end of his life, said, um, I'm just tired of living. And sometimes some folks, when they're older, feel that way. I, I was raised by my grandmother, with whom I lived for, on my own for the last 12 years of her life. And often, she used to say to me, I'm tired, I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm ready to go to be with the Lord. She was a wonderful woman who was instrumental in me becoming a Christian. But she grew tired, and sometimes when we're older, we can have that experience uh, too. Or there's a great writer called Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century. When asked what was life all about, he said, life is nasty, brutish, and short. Well, some people feel that about their life experience. Maybe you're feeling very positive and optimistic, uh, this morning, but those are just a few quotations from different generations of how people have approached life. Now then, that's why I wanted to read this passage this morning. Uh, you could call this, this passage, the theme is um, faith on trial. And the passage is important, the psalm is important for three reasons, I think. Um, the first is that it's a personal testimony or a life story. I don't know if you like reading biographies. I was just talking with a friend last week who's written his autobiography. It's 900 pages long, and uh, he needs it to have it edited down by half that size. Um, uh, but this is the life story of someone called Asaph. Most of the Psalms in the Old Testament, the 150 Psalms, are written by King David, of whom we sang earlier. This one is not written by David. It's written by Asaph. He only wrote a few uh, Psalms. This is one of them. And if you want to understand the life of Asaph, you just read this psalm because it shows what question dominated his whole life. He grappled with this question as long as he lived. He's writing this psalm at the end of his life, um, but clearly uh, he struggled with the question that he raises uh, all through the psalm. That's the first reason. It's a, an autobiographical psalm in just uh, about 30 or so uh, verses. The second reason this psalm is important is because it's what Bible scholars call a psalm of lament. That means when you're grieving or saddened by what's happening around you. Now, I don't know if you ever watch Songs of Praise, but a few years ago, the BBC did a survey around Britain about to try and find out what were the 100 most popular hymns and songs. 99 of the 100 songs were songs of uh, not just praise, but relating to victory in the Christian life. Only one was a song of lament. However, when you read the Psalms, 85 to 90 of the Psalms are Psalms of lament, and only about 60 are Psalms of victory. Now, often the Psalms of lament also highlight an element of victory. But many people have been helped by the Psalms because they touch on the existential or the felt questions that we experience ourselves. Sometimes David comes out with some astonishing statements, things I, could, I don't feel I could pray or say to God like, how will I have to take counsel in my own soul? Why are you so far off, O oh God? Amazing things that he says to God. But what strikes me is that God doesn't rebuke him for saying those things. Because as a loving Heavenly Father, he's prepared to receive 
uh, and, and cure uh, the things that we're struggling with as well. So it's a psalm of lament. That's why friends in Ukraine tell me that they're reading a psalm every day over the last couple of years. Because it's the psalms, it's in the psalms that they sense that God, who spoke through the psalms 3,000 years ago, they were written about 1,000 years before Jesus, it's through the psalms that they can identify that God comes alongside his people who are struggling and experiencing difficulties. And that leads to the third reason why this psalm is important. It's because it deals with somebody's number one question that they grappled with in life. Now, you may be the kind of Christian who never has any questions that you're struggling with. I've spent 45 years traveling around the world, speaking evangelistically, often starting with questions that people raise. Number one question is always, where's God in the midst of suffering? Or where is God when it hurts? And that's part of the theme uh, in this passage. Where is God in the midst of my difficulties? But that is compounded for Asaph and made more difficult because he struggles with another question in the first instance. And it's this, if you can read it in those first few verses. Why do the wicked seem to progress? And by implication, why is it often so difficult for believers? Whether it's because they have marital difficulties or they can't find work, or they have struggles with health, or depression, or discouragement, or aloneness. We would be very unusual human beings if we had none of these experiences during the course of our lives. Some of us may be born naturally with sunny dispositions. That's not because we are spiritually stronger than others. That's the way that we were born. If you look at a lot of other people in scriptures, they weren't born with sunny dispositions. They were born with a capacity to see the downside of life and often exacerbated by emotional turmoil or their own experiences. Anyway, this was Asaph's issue. If you look at the first verse in the psalm, however, you see the conclusion of his reflection. And we've just sung about it. And it, it says in verse 1, truly, is, truly God is good. Now, this struck me in the last week because I actually went to speak at the funeral of my successor as the leader of IFS, who died of leukemia just a few weeks ago. And in the funeral service last uh, Monday morning, we sang a beautiful song about the goodness of God at the graveside. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I'll sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. All my life you've been so, so good with every breath that I'm able. I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You've led me through the fire. In darkest night you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I've lived in the goodness of God. If you want to see what the hymn is so you can look it up. It's beautifully sung. Goodness of God I'll show you afterwards. Well... Um, Asaph, at the end of his life, has come to this conclusion. But he was pretty, ro pretty rocky before then. He obviously struggled with the goodness of God. Because in verse 2, he goes on to say, But as for me, my feet almost stumbled. That wasn't how he felt all through his life, however long he lived. And then he states the problem in these first 15 or 16 verses. He says, I, I almost stumbled... Verse 2, my steps had nearly slipped. Verse 3, I was envious of the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they had no pangs in their death. Their bodies were fat and sleek. They're not in trouble. They're not streaken. Pride is their necklace. Violence covers them. Their eyes swell out with fatness. Hearts overflow with follies. They speak with malice. They threaten opposition. And they set their mouths against heaven. And even then they begin to mock God, he says of these people. They say, how can God know is their knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain, I've kept my heart clean. Some believers struggle with that issue. Why keep my heart clean when some of these folks seem to ride roughshod over the peoples of the world? It's not just those who are wealthy, but it's some political leaders. You only have to look at some of the leaders in the world today, like the situation in Russia, and see the treatment of the Russian people and the Ukrainian people. And you think, 
How long, O Lord? And believers have asked this question often uh, across history when there have been powerful individuals who have oppressed the people. And sometimes, therefore, people ask, why doesn't God intervene? Now, for some years, when I was traveling, I saw one book in many airport shops which was popular uh, all across the world. It was written by a very liberal a Jewish rabbi called Rabbi Kushner. And it was just entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And he asks that question, and his second question, or corollary, was, where is God when bad things happen to good people? And the answer he came to, it's a wrong answer, I'll deal with it in a moment, but the answer he came to in answer to the question, where is God in the midst of bad things happening to good people and the rise of wicked rulers? The answer he came to is, God does exist, but he doesn't intervene because he's weak. That was his conclusion. Many people around, that, around the world bought that book and bought the idea. But what it highlights to us is that many of the difficulties we face in life, uh, even as believers are because of a distorted or misunderstood notion of the character and the person of God. So that's why, as you turn to God's answer in this passage, when Asaph is raising this question, how can God be good when the wicked are progressing, when there's oppression on the face of the earth? Where is God in the midst of it when believers are experiencing difficulties? When you reach halfway through the, the psalm, you begin to see that the answer that God gives to that question is, Asaph, you need to understand my character in order to find an answer to this question. Remember that because many, I'll say it again, many of the problems that we have in life are exacerbated because we have a distorted view of God. In fact, we can make up an image of the God that we want to believe in rather than the God who reveals himself in Scripture. So in this passage, God gives an answer to Asaph by revealing four things about his character which are really important for us to understand. As he's laid out the question, he says, all day long I've been stricken, verse 14, rebuked every morning. Um, but then he says in verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. So he's finished dealing with the question. He's laid the question out. He's wearied by it. It was lifelong. But then you see a change or a shift in the psalm. And this is one of the wonderful things about the Scripture, is that God gives us answers to the big existential questions that dominate our thinking. They are in the Scriptures. As one great Christian writer, Francis Schaeffer, said, God doesn't give us exhaustive answers to the questions we have, but he gives us sufficient in order to believe, and he gives us the best answers to the issue of suffering or whatever it is. And here is the answer that God gives to Asaph in response to his question, why are the wicked progressing, and why do believers seem to be in difficulty or in turmoil? The shift occurs in verse 17 and following, where we begin to see... Um, the first thing about the character of God. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes, O Lord. When you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. What's he revealing about God's character there? This, this surprising thing that God reveals about himself to Asaph, in answer to his question, why are the wicked progressing? Why is it so difficult for believers? God's first answer is, Asaph, I'm a God of judgment and of justice. You can trust me. Now, elsewhere in the Psalms, David says, rejoice for the Lord your God will judge with equity or with fairness. Many people don't rejoice in judgment. They are fearful of it. But David says you can rejoice in God's judgment because it's absolutely fair. Sometimes you even look at our own judicial system and you see that, that the law makes mistakes. 
in the law courts. I always remember a friend of mine who uh, um, was uh, uh, lost a child because um, he was on the Welsh News some years ago. Uh, uh, a butcher was not preparing the meat properly, providing it in a school, and uh, several a dozen children were damaged by this, uh, uh, this meat. One child died. And I remember the parents on Wales Today knew said, uh, we'll have our day in court. We'll see judgment done. But the man, the butcher, had a lot of money. He hired a hotshot barrister from London who got him off on a technicality. He just spent, uh, he was in prison for less than a year. And then the mother came on television subsequently and said, it doesn't seem fair. The law seems to be an ass. We've lost our son forever, and he'll be out for Christmas, having Christmas lunch with his family. It seems unjust. Well, even the best legal system can make, make mistakes. What the Bible tells us about the character of God, however, is that he's absolutely just. And he's a God who judges nations as well as people. Nations, first of all. Sometimes you look at nations mentioned in the Old Testament and they seem so powerful. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, who hears of them these days? The Jews thought they were impossible to defeat in battle. And yet God raised them up and God brought them down. He'll do the same with the Western civilization and other great civilizations in history as they become arrogant and as they turn their back on the God of the Bible. Nations will be judged. But the Bible also tells us that individuals will be judged. I was having some work done on my house in the summer, and I have a workman friend called Steve who came to do it. He's not a Christian. He never goes to church. And as my other friend, this Baptist pastor, was installing shelving in a room for me to put the books up, Steve had seen the emergence of this little study or library, and he said, I can see that you're religious. You've got all those books with God in them. He said, um, I'm not religious at all. I don't believe in God. But I tell you what he said, uh, if I did believe in God, I wanted, I'd want to know why hasn't he come and judge the world because the terrible things we're doing to one another. And I said, Steve, but that's what the Bible says. He's going to judge the world. And I said, you're 65 now and the judgment is coming soon. I've just hit 70. I will be judged too. So it's best to prepare because the Bible tells us repeatedly, God is going to judge. You look, at the, you look at the prophets in the Old Testament, the 13 minor prophets and the other greater prophets, and in every single one of them, you have reference to the great and the terrible day of the Lord, or the judgment to come. And effectively, what the prophets are saying in the Old Testament is, just you wait. Don't hurry along God's judgment. Don't plead for it to come quickly, because it's coming. And it won't just be for other nations or for us or for others, but for ourselves. We will also be judged. As Shakespeare said, again, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty days, uh, petty days from, grace, from day to day. Uh, life is just a, a shadow. Man is like, man is like a shadow uh, on a stage uh, whose days come to an end and then he's heard no more. Judgment will come. And there's a hint of that here in the psalm where these men and women are referred to as phantoms. And actually the Bible says several things about the judgment of God. It says it's certain, it'll be clear, and it will be public. So we can rejoice in the judgment of God. That's the first thing. It's an unusual first answer to the question, where is God when the wicked are progressing? And we're facing such, dif such difficulty. God's saying, just you wait, I'm going to judge. And the reason I'm not judging quickly is not because what Rabbi Kushner says, because I'm weak. The reason I'm not judging quickly is because I'm merciful. I'm even going to give Hitler a chance. I'm even going to give Putin a chance. I'm even going to go give the most wicked people 60 to 70 years in general uh, to repent and turn around. The judgment is coming but I will be slow to judge all people because I'm fair and I'm just and, I give them, and I'm compassionate and I give them an opportunity to respond. That's the first thing God, God says. But that's not enough in itself because in the next couple of verses, you see Asaph responding how we often do when we're frustrated with something. 
He was still embittered. Verse 21, if it comes up on the screen, he says, uh, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. You know how you are when you're frustrated about something happening in life. You just want to kick out, usually at your spouse or somebody else in the family, someone close to you because they happen to be near. He was kicking out. He was brutish. Uh, so knowing of the judgment of God wasn't sufficient. That's why God revealed a second thing to him. Secondly, God said, I'm not just the God who judges justly. I'm the God who is continually present. This passage talks about the omnipresence of God. So in verse 23, at the beginning of the verse, he says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. And clearly this impacted Asaph because by verse 26, then he says, but for me, it's good to be near God. This doctrine of the nearness or the omnipresence of God with believers in all circumstances has comforted many believers, including many who are persecuted and spend time in solitary confinement all across the centuries. Let me give a couple of illustrations. Uh, a few years ago, before I was involved in student work, I spent a year traveling with Operation Mobilization around uh, Africa uh, on their ship Logos. And one man came on the ship who was a, a TV broadcaster. He'd just been interviewing uh, a famous Chinese pastor called Wang Min Dao. This pastor was a great preacher in the 1950s. He knew Martin Lloyd-Jones, the Welsh preacher. But he was imprisoned at 55 years of age, and he was in prison for 30 years. So at the peak of his ministry, he was in prison. He spent several periods in solitary confinement. But by the time he was released at 85 years of age, his voice was so weakened, he never preached again. I have a copy of this interview. My friend went to interview him and recorded the interview. And in the interview, he said to him, when you look back at your time in prison, do you ever feel bitterness towards God? You were at the peak of your ministry. Thousands were listening to your preaching. Many were converted. And then it's all gone. You're in prison for 30 years, never to preach again. Do you ever feel bitter or angry towards God? He said, no. Quote, for me, my time in prison, especially in solitary confinement, was a honeymoon with Jesus because I experienced his presence with me every day. Then another time, when I was a student in university, a great Romanian pastor, a Baptist pastor of Jewish background, came to preach. His name was Richard Wurmbrandt. Older believers will remember his name. He came to preach in Wales, too. Remember him preaching without notes in Oxford Town Hall, three nights on Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He had a brilliant intellect. But he was imprisoned for many years also in the 1980s and 70s and uh, in solitary confinement for a long time. And he did something rather remarkable, good lesson for all of us. He memorized whole texts of Scripture. So when he was in prison, he memorized, he, he, he formed and memorized 365 sermons based on texts that he had memorized. And he preached one of these sermons to himself every day. When he was released from prison, he published many of them in his book, Sermons in Solitary Confinement. You can still get copies of it on Amazon. I've got a copy at home. And one of the sermons is on the theme of the omnipresence of God, that God is present with his people in all situations. And in it, he shares a personal testimony, commenting on these verses about God's presence, uh, and even the verse in Psalm 139 where David says, even the thickest of darknesses cannot hide you from me. You think of any darkness you're experiencing in life, that cannot hide us from God's presence. It's a wonderful truth. Anyway, he says that when he was in solitary confinement in his prison, he said, some nights, some days, I couldn't tell if it was daytime or nighttime, rather like this Iranian brother I was referring to earlier. And he said, the presence of God was so great with me in my prison cell that I danced for joy. I could not sleep because of my experience of joy in God's presence. Now, that's an exceptional experience. Some of us may say, well, I haven't experienced that. But God, he wasn't a super saint. God promises to be present with his people, whatever we are going through in life. As another psalmist write that he can turn 
the wells of weeping uh, uh, into joy, into wells of joy uh, in the morning. So the second thing that we hear or learn from this passage is the presence of God is with us. He will continually be with his children. And the big challenge for many of us is that if God seems distant, what the Bible tells us is because we have withdrawn ourselves from him. Because God promises, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. So if you're going through a dark, dark or difficult time now, how should we respond to it? Not primarily by complaining to God, though we can pour out our heart to him, as Asaph and David did in the Psalms, but by deliberately seeking to draw near to God, by reading the Scripture, maybe even memorizing them. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't bring Scriptures to our memory if we haven't memorized them. So it's a good practice, especially when we're young, but at all ages, to memorize key texts of Scripture. Because as one preacher has said, the Christian life is all about living your life based on the promises of God, not primarily on the law, but primarily on the promises which God gives to us about his presence and his help. That's the second thing that God reveals. He's a God of judgment and justice, a God who is omnipresent. But then the third thing that God reveals, oh, let me just tell you one other story about this, um, uh, about the presence of God. I was talking to some Ira uh, Ukrainian friends the other day, and they were telling me at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, uh, you know, people were moving all over the place in the, in the eastern part of the country. Many Ukrainians were, were killed, lost their homes. And uh, they told me a story of a woman called Vera, who was in the village of Irpin. Uh, there, was fa there was fighting famously there at the beginning and trying to escape to Busha nearby. And there was a kind of valley between the two. And there was so much fighting rag raging on, she decided to try to escape uh, under cover of darkness with her child. And so uh, through this valley of death, as it were, she escaped through the night. And in the morning, some Ukrainian soldiers could see her in the distance and wave to her to come and join them. And as she came, came closer to them, she, they, they said to her, we're so glad that we've, we've got you. You are safe now. You're with us. It's good to have you and your son here. But we want to ask, where was the man who was with you? Uh, we saw in our binoculars uh, some male figure with you. And she said, that must have been the presence of Jesus. But she said, I was so frightened. I was singing songs of praise all night and asking for him to be present with me. And perhaps he was, as he was with many in the Old Testament era in this remarkable way. It's often common in Muslim countries today as well. So the presence of God is promised to us. The third thing that the passage says refers to is the providential care of God. And we see that in these next few verses, 23 and 24. Two things, you hold me by the right hand and you guide me with your counsel. This speaks of God's care for his children, just like a loving heavenly father. You know, Muslims have 99 names for God, but there are several things they never say about God, which are only revealed in the Bible. God is gracious, God is personal, God is loving and God is a father. These four things you only find in the Bible in terms of God's self-revelation. And in this passage, you've got this, this hint of the fatherliness of God as he is continually uh, with the psalmist and promises to be with us also and offers grace and help in each situation. Uh, he holds us with the right hand. I had a wonderful story about this. A friend of mine, was a, uh, uh, um, he was of German, Jewish origin, lost some, mem some of his family members in the Holocaust and became Goldschmidt, his name was, changed to Goldsmith. And he went as a missionary to Indonesia. And uh, he had um, uh, some small children, and each morning he used to take them to school, and the school was at the top of a hill. He was trying to teach the kids to be independent. So he was holding his his daughter's hand at the bottom of this hill on a, on a Monday morning. And the, hill was at the, church, the school was at the top of the hill. And he said, do you think you can walk up the hill now, darling, to school on your own without daddy holding your hand? She said, yes, I can, daddy, because God tells us in the Bible that he will hold us by the right hand. So she left her father behind, started walking up the hill, holding her hand in the air as if God was holding her hand, 
walking towards uh, the school, taking it literally. Well, that's what the passage talks of here, that God holds us by the right hand, but also that he guides us with his counsel. That's a reference to the, the scriptures. You know, one of the best phrases to describe the Bible in the Bible itself is this phrase, which is mentioned many times in the Old Testament, that the Bible is the, quote, the voice of God. Sometimes Christians talk about God speaking to me, and God can speak through dreams or through uh, the interaction of other believers or through hearing a song sung in church. But the main way that the, we are told that the God speaks to us is through the Scriptures. They are the voice of God. So if we don't read the Scriptures, we won't hear the voice of God. That's why it's very important to have the discipline of reading the Scriptures day by day and allowing God to speak to us by His Spirit through the scriptures. So God is providentially caring for his children and offering grace in these ways. One of the most powerful illustrations I remember of this was somebody I met when I was a student. He was a brilliant lawyer, probably the most brilliant uh, Christian I've ever met. His name was Professor Sir Norman Anderson. He wrote a brilliant little book defending the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Very powerful. I heard him speak on the subject as well. But um, in the 1990s, when he was 85 years of age, we were both speaking at a conference called Spring Harvest to, I think there were a couple of thousand students there that evening. And the interview with him was one of those interviews with an older believer you remember for decades. He was 85, right at the end of his life. And in front of 2,000 students, um, somebody interviewed him and put this question to him. Professor Anderson... You've been a follower of Jesus Christ for 70 years since you were in your mid-teens. You're now 85. You had three children. They all died before you. One of them committed suicide. He had an up-and-down temperament. And two of them had some kind of hereditary disease. They were brilliant, but you've lost them all. And your wife now has dementia. She can't recognize you anymore. So you have no one to leave your resources to. And all these loved ones have gone or they no longer recognize you. Do you ever ask the question, why me? I thought this guy's gone too far with this question. But then quick as a flash, Professor Anderson came back and said, I never asked the question, why me? I asked the question, why not me? For I'm not promised in a fallen world that these things will not happen to me. When a plane goes down, there may be believers on it or, or, as well as unbelievers. Believers have cancer just as unbelievers do. But he said, the difference between me and the unbeliever when I face these hardships in life is I have the grace of God, which is given to me in three ways. Please remember these three graces of God. If at the moment you're going through difficulties or you know someone else who, does, who is. He said, God has given me grace in three ways which encourage me and sustain me through his providential care. And these graces are first, the promises of Scripture, especially with reference to the hope of heaven and the promise of his presence now. Secondly, the comfort that the Holy Spirit gives as he bears witness with my spirit that God has not abandoned me, but he's with me and he'll be with me through the tough times. And he said the third thing which God has given me is the companionship of God's people. Three graces, the promises of Scripture, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the companionship of God's people. They were all great to us when our only daughter died 37 years ago. Now, I'm sure some of you may have had that experience. What God does in those situations is he provides us with his grace. This is what Norman Anderson said, which doesn't eradicate the pain, but it reduces its potency so that we can survive and trust him while we're in this life before we go to uh, eternity. So the providential care of God is available. As he holds us with his right hand, he won't let us go, and he guides us with his counsel. But we must read his counsel in order to draw upon it. Now, those are the first three things he says, and I must conclude with the fourth and the final thing that God reveals about himself. In answer to this question, where is God when it hurts? Where is God when the wicked progress? The answer God gives is, 
Asaf, you need to understand my character. First, I'm a God of judgment and justice. I will judge, and I will do it in my own time. Uh, a thousand days, a thousand years is as a day with me. Be patient. I am being patient with people because I'm compassionate. Secondly, uh, I promise to be with you in all circumstances. Thirdly, I'll providentially care for you. Uh, I'll hold you by, my right, by the right hand and will give you counsel. Then the fourth thing God reveals about himself is he's the God of all hope. And it's there in that little phrase at the end of verse 24. Afterwards you will receive me to glory. Surprising, the Old Testament doesn't actually say very much about heaven. There are some references to glory, that's the word used here, or the heaven of heavens. But most of the references to heaven are in the New Testament, especially from the writings and the sayings of Jesus and Paul. Not many insights into the nature of heaven in the Old Testament. Several different words are used there. But here he clearly uses the word glory to refer to the hope to come. That's what I heard of in my friend's funeral on Monday. Listen to the quotations of some people who were not believers, even atheists, all their lives as they face death and compare them with the words of believers. Uh, Somerset Maughan, a lapsed Catholic writer, uh, said, "When I, uh, death for me is a step into the unknown. Or Bertrand Russell, the great English philosopher, said, when I die, uh, I will rot. Uh, no hope at all. Compare that with the words of Coretta Scott King, the wife of Martin Luther King, the black civil rights leader, Baptist minister, who was shot dead at 37 years of age. At his funeral, she said, they ended my husband's earthly existence with one bullet, but not all the bullets in all the world can end, in all the arsenals in all the world can end his eternal existence, for my husband is with God. Or the words of John Penry, the great Puritan uh, church leader in the 1590s who was executed in Newport in South Wales, not far from where I currently live, and just before he was executed for going to a meeting just like this. There weren't many martyrs in that era, in the Elizabethan Tudor era in Wales. Uh, the culture re uh, remained steadfastly Catholic, but there were some, mostly in the southeast. He was executed for leading a small group in a gathering like this. And the night before he was executed, he saw his wife for the last time. And this is what he, this is what he said to her. Now, now, dear beloved wife, do not grieve. I have been your husband for a season, but I will be your brother for eternity. That's how you feel if you're in a marriage with another believer or praying that your married partner will become a believer and trust in the Lord also, that you might be able to say that. We all have to die at some point. But we can be brothers and sisters for eternity in God's purposes because of the promise of glory and the, the promise of being with him. A friend of mine was telling me the other day about this missionary who went to the South Pacific. And he was there for 20 years working with headhunters and people involved in evil spirits and all this kind of stuff. And um, uh, this missionary was there for 20 years. He didn't see a single person become a believer. So many people might say, oh, he failed. What a waste of a life. Then he died after 20 years. No believers at all. And then the missionary agency sent a younger guy in his 20s. And after about 18 months, revival broke out. Thousands were converted, whole tribes. So this young man went to see the chief of the tribe and said to him, Sir, you had this wonderful godly missionary for 20 years. Nobody became a believer in his lifetime. I've only been here for 18 months and revival's broken out. It can't be anything to do with me because I can't speak the language. And the chief said to him, You're right, young man. It's nothing to do with you. But he said, When that missionary was with us for 20 years, he said, You have to understand we were into evil spirits and uh, afraid of the darkness, and of death, and so many other things. We were paranoid about it. But he said, this missionary told us time and time again, you don't need to fear death. He said, for death is it's like when you're going from one room to another, and Jesus is there waiting for you. So he said, I'm not fearful of death, because I know what's coming my way. So he said, the whole tribe waited and watched when he fell ill, to see if he would be true to what he told us. 
And then he died trusting God, not fearful. When we saw that, that's why we all believed after he'd gone. Now, for those of you who are older, now I've hit 72. The younger ones are watching us. It's not over yet until it is over. And the last act for many of us is to trust God into our dotage in the 70s and 80s. As Billy Graham said, old age uh, is not for sissies. Some will have many ailments, and sometimes the number increases through the 70s and 80s. Our calling is to trust God in the midst of it, to serve and to reach out as best we can, and entrust our lives to him, knowing that there is a glory, and he will take us home to that glory, and be a witness before the watching world that we are not casting off the God who is with us in the good times, but also the God who is with us in our frailty and our feebleness and our difficulties. If you have children and grandchildren, they're watching you. I tell you what, unbelievers are watching too because they want believers to be seen to be consistent. They want us to succeed. They want to believe that there's something better in life than the constant complaining of so many, that there are people who trust in the God of the Bible, who are faithful to him, who is kept by him, and who remains steadfast right to the end. A very close friend died on Friday, and his wife sent me a beautiful text yesterday saying, Bill faced many indignities the last few years of his life. For four years, he, lost, he had a stroke. He couldn't even speak. All he could say was yes and no. And his wonderful wife cared for him all that time and his daughters. And she said he bore the indignities, trusting constantly in God. He was a wonderful man and a wonderful husband. What a testimony after someone has just left. Well, may God also call us to trust him as, as the God of all hope. And that's why right at the end, Asaph says in verse 28, 27, 28, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For me, it's good to be near God. I've made the Lord God my refuge. And that's the question we should, we should ask ourselves as we conclude. Am I making God my refuge? Not just being someone who warms a seat in church or comes along to meetings, but deliberately making God our refuge and trusting him as the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And right at the end, he says, that I may tell of all your works. Speaking of him, even really in the twilight years and days, telling of his works and of his goodness to us all our days. So yes, at the end of his life, Asaf comes to this conclusion, God is good. But boy, he had a rocky time in between with these, with these questions. If you're having a rocky time with questions, it's not wrong to ask the questions. Because the God that we worship is a God who catches questions and answers them. The answers are substantially then scriptured. They may not be exhaustive, but they're enough to satisfy us if you do the research in terms of how the Bible answers these questions. For me, it's a wonderful testimony about the value of scriptures that God faces Asaph's question head on. Doesn't brush it off and say, you're not supposed to ask questions. He deals with the question, but says the answer is found in my character. I'm the God of justice and judgment. I'm the God who is omnipresent. I'm the God who will sovereignly care for and providentially care for his children. And I'm the God of all hope. Is that the God that we are trusting in and worshiping today? Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you took Asaf's question seriously and you provided substantial answers to them. We want to pray that especially if there are some today who are struggling, that they'll go to you, look to you, find answers in your promises and your word, or that you'll speak to them through the loving kindness of other believers as believers gather around and the church is at its best in that situation, or that your Holy Spirit will comfort them through the internal witness. Make your grace known to us. Shed it abroad in our hearts, we pray. 
And just as you've spoken and ministered to many going through persecution in other parts of the world, we experience adversity, if not persecution. So we ask that for all those saints who are gathered here, that you will comfort them and that we'd all be able to say in unison, surely the Lord is good. Amen. Amen.